Hello, and welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Today's episode is part of the Best Of series, where we highlight some of the most exciting and enthralling and enlightening episodes from the archives of the Psychology Podcast. Enjoy. In this episode, I talk to renowned neuroscientist Lisa Feldman Barrett about emotions in the brain. Dr. Barrett is among the top 1% most cited scientists in the world and has been called, quote, the most important affective scientists of our time. In this episode, Dr. Barrett reveals what the true function of the brain is, and it's not just for thinking. We also discuss the impact of past experiences on our cognition and what we can do to overcome our own detrimental patterns. Further into our discussion, Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett challenges the traditionally held view that emotions are universal. In her own theory of constructed emotion, she argues that variability in emotional expression exists due to socialization and language differences. We also touch on the topics of hallucinogens, culture, education, relationships, and authoritarianism. This was a really stimulating conversation. And while we don't see eye to eye on everything, she really broadened my mind and had me thinking of new ways of thinking about emotions and the brain. There's no doubt that she's a legend in this field and it was a real honor chatting with her. So now I bring you Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett. Dr. Barrett, so great to chat with you today on the Psychology Podcast. It's really great to be on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. I've wanted to talk to you for a really long time. Uh, you know, you're a real leader in this field, and the way that you think about it is quite, uh, quite unique and and different from some of the things you know that that a lot of people are even still being taught in introductory psychology textbooks, right? True. So yeah, we got we got to update this. We got to update this. <laughs> we started your career as a clinical psychologist. Is that right? You so that was your dream of going to clinical. I don't know that I would say that was my dream. That was mm. just where I ended up, certainly. Fair enough. Um, uh, yeah, you know, I had the choice to take the more academic route in cognitive psychology or the more academic route in a actually or potentially practice based route in clinical psychology. And I, for a number of reasons, chose clinical psychology. Um, but, you know, my advisor was a social psychologist. I had one clinical and one social advisor. So I would say I, um, I always had like one foot out the door, <laughs> you know, even mm-hmm. when I was training to be a clinician. You know, I'm glad that I have clinical training. I think it's actually served me really well in, in my research career. But, um, but early on, it became clear to me that I just really loved research and I really loved the science end of things. Yeah, and I mean you're curious about um, everything because you've you've really you've started adding on um, other fields that you've started to in- integrate into your work. But you see that even early in your in your career, you know, where you're uh, you spent a decade training in uh, psychophysiology and neuroanatomy, right, and neuroscience, yeah. and yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, after I was a professor, so. Um, uh you know, and eventually I made my way back to cognitive and, um, and other, even adding on other fields. So I think that's one, you know, maybe one thing that uh, marks my work as different or the work that I do with my colleagues and my, in the lab that I, that I um, developed. Um, So all my peeps um, over the years is that, you know, we read broadly and we draw broadly from a number of different disciplines within psychology and and also outside psychology and that just gives you a really different perspective on psychological questions psychological mechanisms and um and the underlying biological basis of those mechanisms yeah i completely agree and and i was really excited to see you get into evolutionary and developmental neuroscience and cultural evolution systems engineering um all these kind of perspectives give you a systems view of the brain which is, uh, I mean, I, it's so it's so clear how that links to your theory of emotions because if you take very discrete view of emotions as or a very modular view, I should say, right? Um, you could see how um, uh, that's in some ways antithetical from a, a broader systems or network perspective, or, or could be. Yeah, exactly. In the nineteenth century, uh, physiologists and neurologists and philosophers realized that there was the possibility of using um, the pros- the mechanisms and the, the labs, the lab procedures and so on of neurology and physiology to search for the physical basis of mental categories that ex- have existed really in mental philosophy going all the way back to um, uh, ancient Greece. 
And when you take that approach, it, it sort of suggests to you a very modular approach where a word like episodic memory or semantic memory or anger or sadness or fear refers to some specific set of psychological processes or a process which it, you know can be found in some modular part of the brain. But when you start with the brain and the nervous system and how it develops and how it evolved, and then you ask yourself, well, if you given, you know, we're a certain type of creature with a certain type of nervous system and a certain type of brain, how is it that that, um, you know, nervous system in the context of other brains and nervous system uh, of other people, um, how does that produce the thoughts and feelings um, and mental events that we have in that we experience in this culture, but that are not general to all cultures in the world, right? So you, you have really a, a single kind of nervous system architecture that can create many different types of minds. And so how does that work exactly? And it's not denying the fact that we feel anger and sadness and fear, but it doesn't presume that there are ancient circuits for these emotions embedded somewhere in some, you know, ancient beast lurking in your brain somewhere um it, it it's a very different approach to start with the biology and then ask start asking questions about the psychology than doing it the other way around yeah yeah i mean i know that a, a question a big question you're interested in is why do we have a brain you know why <laughs> why why does a brain exist it's so metabolically expensive and um and 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 you've you've given answers uh, such as it uh, for regulation of uh, of our senses and uh for for prediction um i know that prediction is a is is um a big one and uh and uh i i've described the brain as a prediction machine you know but i want to take the question one step further because even more intriguing to me is why do we have a neocortex like why why not just a brain but but why do like me when i say we i mean me and you um humans why do we have a prefrontal cortex? Like, why do we have a lateral prefrontal cortex? <laughs> yeah, so let me just say that there's really debate amongst evolutionary bio evolutionary neuroscientists as to whether the neocortex is actually new, hmm. right? But so um, yeah. uh, there's some uh, there's one way of looking at evolution, brain evolution, which suggests that the neurons that create the so-called neocortex, the more um, neutral term is isocortex. Um, mm. Actually, are we're pre are present in in all vertebrates and um, are even present in animals that don't have a cortex, a cerebral cortex, like birds, for example. Um, that there are homologous neurons there, um, and um, so what we think of as new may not be new at all. It's the organization that's new. You know, the uh, evolutionary neuroscientist George Streeter has this great saying that as brains get bigger, they reorganize like companies. Um, so it's not necessarily that new things emerge, but more that, um, you know, Barb Finley's work, the uh, neuroscientist Barb Finley suggests that all the vertebrates who've ever been studied, it looks like their brains go through exactly the same developmental stages, um, it, it, you know, from embryos forward. But what changes is the duration of each stage. So some parts get, some neurons grow for longer periods of time than others. And that produces these um, architectural differences, these anatomical differences in, in brains. And one answer to your question or a partial answer to your question is that um, we have a large cerebral cortex because um, or we have a, what looks like a big neocortex. Um, because we live long lives and uh, wow. and the size of the brain is really tends to be very, very related to the longevity of the animal's life. Not perfectly, but there's not a perfect relationship there, but um, you know, we live long lives and um, we, our brains function best when we can draw on past experience in order to predict the future which becomes the present. And in order to do that, we, we, we need to have a lot of, you know, a lot of storage space <laughs> as it were. Although, you know, brains don't store anything. They just re reassemble um, past the past. They don't store it in any kind of um, way, any kind of biological yeah. way. 
I'll quote you. You said, you've said in another uh, interview, re remembering is reassembling the past and the present for the purpose of making sense of sense data and doing this predictively. I thought that was beautiful. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it's both really for the purposes of regulating the body. Um, and, you know, so we make sense of sense data for the purposes of regulating the body. That's, you know, we don't see and hear and smell because it's fun or because it's interesting. Um, you know, senses evolved um, when um, when the forebrain evolved, um, and uh, because bodies got bit really complicated, uh, and um, animals had to have more awareness of their surroundings. Yeah, so that that does link to. I was going to ask you about the evolution of consciousness, and um, we needed to have greater awareness of our surroundings. I mean, it seems like a good um, partial explanation for why uh, the lights turned on at some point in human evolution. Yeah, but although you know that's, tr I wouldn't say they turned on in human evolution. I mean, the evidence suggests that you know the cortex isn't really necessary for consciousness. So if you look at mm. Bjorn Merker's work. Um, it looks like, you know, really what you need is a midbrain. Um, mm -hmm. So you need the superior colliculus and you need the things it's connected to, including the hypothalamus. Um, but they, you don't need a necessarily a cerebral cortex for, for consciousness. Um, and so... Have you, have you read any Daniel Bohr's work, The Ravenous Brain? I have not. Because he just he like argues... Bohr? Daniel Bohr, he's a neuroscientist at Cam University mm -hmm. of Cambridge. He has a very interesting argument where he does link it very much to the uh, the prefrontal cortex, the lateral prefrontal cortex, and our ability for chunking and patterns. That consciousness um, really is this ability to take lots and lots of sources of information and uh, be able to perceive it in our in our field of view. And um, and 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 he includes chunking as an important part of that. But but I, but yeah, I, well, I, you're me, absolutely but, right. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, I, I would just say I'm not, it's not an, I, I mean, I, this, there's a very seminal paper in published in behavioral and brain sciences in 2007, where Bjorn Merker reviews the literature on people who basically, because of hydrocephaly and, and other kinds of problems have no cerebral cortex to speak mm -hmm. of, and they're really quite conscious. <laughs> so um, mm -hmm. there's no question that um, what, the cerebral cortex does is um, because of its architecture, it certainly allows us to compress information and abstract what you call chunking. I would call abstraction mm -hmm. um, or, you know, conceptualizing. Um, it doesn't happen in the prefrontal cortex. It's not a, it's not the lateral prefrontal cortex. That's a misnomer. I would say it doesn't actually, I mean, certainly that part of the brain is involved, but the, there's a whole, architecture uh, along the, um, you know, the cortical sheet, which is basically compressing information and, um, and reducing dimensionality of that information so that you can summarize a lot of details um, with features that are um, more abstract, it's just kind of like compressing an MP3 or, you know, like what Netflix uses when it streams movies to you over the internet. Um, so I hope those things aren't conscious yet, though. <laughs> well, you know, actually, uh, there is a theory of consciousness which suggests that a certain degree of complexity is what produces consciousness and and can produce consciousness in in other agents that are not human or not living. Um, I'm not going to get into that debate because I don't really know Pan enough about it. But panpsychism, yeah, exactly. Is hot. Yeah, it's and hot. I'm not going to. Yeah, it <laughs> yeah. may be hot, but you know, just because something is interesting and comfortable intuitive doesn't make it you know real or true but in any case um uh you know it is interesting but it's not something i know well enough to to discuss but what i do know is that it's important to make a distinction between experiencing something and being self-reflectively aware that you're experiencing it and the experience of the world that is experiencing light, experiencing sound, experiencing smell, doesn't require a cerebral cortex. But being aware of that, um, being self-reflexively aware of it may involve a cortex. I don't know, but that, that could be true.
Yeah, a particular uh, brain network that has fascinated me in my career is the default mode network, or in Papa already, I call it the imagination network. But it obviously does more than the social imagination. But social imagination is a big part of it, you know, your ability to project um, yourself in the future. But it's a very self-related network, very, you know, right? And so, but it's always fascinating to me when that network, you know, when people take like hallucinogens or psychedelics and things that that alter that brain network. So the self, you know, is somehow altered in some way, what that experience is like. And, and then the experience of consciousness in those moments is very, it's a very different state of consciousness. It's not, it's not our, it's not most people's everyday state of consciousness being on LSD, at least not for me, not my everyday experience. <laughs> so anyway, I was just wondering in your own career, have you um, made uh, much contact with uh, the default mode network in your own research? And what are your thoughts on its, on its evolutionary function? What is conventionally called the default mode network, which is an, a network that's been identified in the intrinsic, you know, um, connectivity uh, in the brain, has many names, right? It has mm. it has more aliases, I think, than Sherlock Holmes, right? So it's <laughs> been called the mentalizing I'm network, you on and that. The, Im- yeah. the imagination network, and the self network, and mm. it's the memory network, and it's the context network, and it's the you know, okay, and so. You know, scientists have a tendency to look at circuitry and then name it on behalf of whatever phenomenon they're interested in. So true. Um, and But I guess I look at that network and I think, okay, it contains half of the circuitry in the brain that is responsible for regulating your body. Hmm. So whatever else it's doing... Whatever else it's doing, psychologically speaking, it's also regulating your autonomic nervous system, your immune system, your endocrine system, um, and, and the other systems of your body. And so this is just a hypothesis. You know, I don't study uh, hallucinogens um, at the moment, but um, you know, one um, way to think about what's happening um, uh, with um, psilocybin and, and other um, hallucinogens, ketamine, um, even it, is that, um, you know, even when your brain is at rest, it's still attached to your body and it's still regulated. Your, your body and your brain are still talking to each other when you're asleep, um, when you're at rest, you know, even when you're daydreaming, your brain is never detached from your body. So your body is always in training your brain, always in training your brain, except maybe when you take these hallucinogens. So maybe what's happening with hallucinogens and the reason why you can have these like completely wild um, experiences and the reason why you need a guide lest you go off the rails is that um, the normal constraints, your brain is basically associating from one moment to the next. That's what predictions are. That's what imagination is. That's what daydreaming is. Um, that's what, you know, perceptual inference is, simulation, all these words we have. That's how you know something is important, you know, in the sciences that there are many names for it. Um, and, but your brain is constrained by your body and it's often constrained by the world. But when you go to sleep and the control um, networks in your brain, including the def- uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, um, you know, your brain is less constrained to associate, um, less constrained by the world because uh, information from the world, sense data from the world is not processed as much, but there's mm-hmm. still this anchoring in the body. And and so, sure, you know, crazy things can happen in your dreams, but some things don't happen because they're probably, um, uh, you know, weeded out. But when you relax that constraint, then you really do have more like a brain in a vat, right? And and so maybe that's what's happening. I mean, I have no idea, but uh, you know, that's one thought that I've had often, and that's why people have this sense of they're disconnected from the self because yeah. many scientists, including Antonio Damasio, but others as well, have talked about a fundamental sense of self being rooted in the brain's modeling of the body we don't experience it that way but but there's some reasonable evidence to suggest that that that's really how it's working yeah yeah 
It's so, it's so, it's such a, a new frontier. You know, a lot of people, uh, you know, good researchers at Johns Hopkins, for instance, are looking into this issue. I mean, so much to be discovered. I'm not going to claim that I, <laughs> that I have figured out. Oh, no, anyway. but I mean, I think it's a really cool frontier. Actually, everybody, yeah. like all of these centers for studying psychedelics are popping up. There's one at Mass General. There's one at Berkeley mm -hmm. now. There's like, they're all, you know, they're, they're all popping London, up. London, London. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, you know, in your book, Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain, uh, one of them is your brain is not for thinking. Can you tell uh, my neurotic brain uh, that fact? Can you, you know, like, <laughs> I mean, like, you know, because my, I overthink everything. I have a shirt that says, too busy overthinking and overfeeling. <laughs> <laughs> I, need to, I need to get, I need to get one of those shirts too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, the way I think of it is our brains are like the masters of deception. You know, they create our experience and they guide our actions, but they do it in ways that don't reveal how they're doing it. You know, they just, and, and uh, so your own experience is not a really great guide for what your brain is actually doing under the hood. Um, mm. And so the way that I think about it is that um, based on evolutionary considerations is that, you know, brains, not all animals have brains. And as you said, brains are really expensive metabolically. I mean, that three pound blob of meat between your ears is the most metabolically expensive, exactly, organ that you have. And um, it's not frugal. <laughs> mm. So um, what's it, you know, its main job really is to keep your body alive and, um, to keep you alive and, and well, and, um, and thinking and feeling and seeing and so on are in the service of that task. Now mm -hmm. we don't live our lives that way and we don't experience every feeling that we have and every, you know, insult that we bear and every hug that we give and every, you know, jog that we take and every, argument that we have, you know, we don't experience our lives that way. But that does seem to be, from my perspective, the best explanation for how to think about thinking and feeling and so on in the dynamics of the brain. And when you start thinking about it that way, it suggests, it opens up all kinds of new avenues of thought for Things like why we have an opioid epidemic. Why do we have record levels of depression, you know, in this country and around the world? Why does authoritarian thinking seem to emerge, you know, during economic hardship? I mean, there, there are psychological explanations that people give that are incomplete, I would say, because they don't consider what's happening um, at the biological level and when you start to think about those factors a lot of hypotheses sort of emerge um it's this very fruitful um way to you know think about what psychological functions are for <laughs> exactly I am so excited to announce that registrations are now open for our self-actualization coaching intensive. While the coaching industry has taken great strides over the years toward integrating more evidence-based coaching approaches, there is still a lot of work to be done. Many coach training programs still lack strong foundations in science and do little to incorporate research-informed tools, methodologies, or approaches for helping clients thrive. For 20 years, I've dedicated my career to rigorously testing ways to unlock creativity, intelligence, and our potential as human beings. Now for the first time ever, I have compiled some of my greatest insights to bring the new science of self-actualization to the field of professional coaching. This immersive three-day learning experience will introduce you to self-actualization coaching, an approach intended to enhance your coaching practice by offering you evidence-based tools and insights from my research that will equip you to more effectively help your clients unlock their unique potential. Don't miss out on this unique opportunity. Join us and take your coaching practice to the next level. Go to sacoaching.org. That's sacoaching.org. I look forward to welcoming you in December.
Well, let's pick one and double click on it. Uh, can I pick the authoritarian during economic hardship one? Because that's sure. super interesting to me. And I'm trying to figure that one out myself. Um, it's the same with populism, you know, uh, you, you see during certain environmental conditions. What are these environmental conditions? How is it interacting with the brain? You know, how can the biological perspective help explain this, particularly from a, maybe even a prediction? Because I, I, I could see where you're going, but I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear what your, your thoughts are. Sure, sure. So the first thing though, um, you know, that I would say is, um, I want to make it really clear that what I'm offering here is is um, a, a hypothesis. I'm not claiming anything is true, and I'm okay. also yeah. not reducing everything to biology. Like this is not a reductionist um, explanation of yeah. anything. It's actually what I'm suggesting is that there are that this is a complex um, matter, and when I say complex, I don't, I don't just mean like, wow, this is super complicated, although it is super complicated, but I mean, really in terms of the causation is, is, um, complex, meaning there are multiple factors which are interacting with each other. And, um, I think one of the factors that that's interacting with other, with other, one of the, one of the causal factors or one of the causal forces amongst many that are interacting, um, is, um, the state of your, um, metabolism. So, um, you know, the, the best way for me to describe it is to say, um, to use an, to use a metaphor that I use in seven and a half lessons, which is that, you know, your brain is running a budget for your body and it's not budgeting money. It's budgeting salt and glucose and water and oxygen and all the nutrients that, um, you know, you need to keep yourself alive and well, because you have gazillions of cells in your body and they all need oxygen and they all have to have waste removed. And, you know, and so there's a, a, a need to, to sort of um, make sure that nutrients get where they need to go before they're needed. If you wait until after they're needed, there's a tax that you pay, a little metabolic tax. So there's this body budgeting function that your brain is performing. And you know, when your brain is, well, what do you do when your budget, when your financial budget's in running a deficit, you stop spending? What does that mean for a brain? Well, the two most expensive things that your brain can do is move your body or learn something new. Mm. And so what happens when people are running um, a deficit in their body budget when their meta metabolism metabolically, they're just not, um, it's not just, it's not as efficient as it should be. Maybe they're not getting enough, maybe they're not getting enough sleep. Maybe they're not eating healthfully. Maybe they're not drinking enough water. Maybe they're um, economically burdened. Maybe they're socially isolated or lonely. Maybe all of these things actually translate pretty directly into body budgeting burdens. I could go on and on and on, but um, what happens is you might feel fatigued and you might, you know, stop moving around as much. Um, you might feel, I should also say there's a real feeling of unpleasantness um, that comes with body budgeting deficits. Um, and then your brain's going to be looking for a um, cause for that um, unpleasantness. And um, if somebody conveniently points to an immigrant or somebody who mm -hmm. doesn't look like you or somebody who is different from you in some way, it, that's an easy explanation for your feeling of unpleasantness. But more importantly, I think, even more importantly than that is that, um, you know, what's hard uh, to deal with it, uh, it, when you're running a deficit is complexity. Like you, people look for simple single causes they look for simplicity and they look for no, you know, things that certainty with no ambiguity. And exactly. so if you look at populism or authoritarianism or, or totalitarian thinking, and you look at the analysis of that from a political standpoint, political science or historical standpoint, what you, what you see scholars saying is these things tend to arise. People start looking for simple single causes and they start looking for, um, you know, certainty and aversion to ambiguity and uh, uncertainty and so on. These things start happening when, um, you know, people are stressed in some way. And what is stress? Stress is just literally your brain is preparing your body for a big metabolic outlay 
and it may or may not come. So you're sort of squandering your resources, driving your body budget into deficit. So it's not only economic concerns that can cause this chaos, right? So when you have a president or a, a leader of your country who just plunges the country into chaos where you can't predict, that is extremely metabolically costly for you. You won't feel it as a metabolic cost. You'll just feel like shit, basically. You know, and it results in, um, you know, uh, over the long term, um, there there are consequences. So that's actually what I think is in part happening. I think that when you look at regimes that um, uh, are um, like dictators and so on, you know, usually what precedes that is a period of chaos where the country is being thrown into chaos and uncertainty is really hard for a nerve, a human nervous system. It's really metabolically expensive. And what your brain attempts to do in uncertainty is learn. But if you don't have the spoons to learn, you're just going to avoid that uncertainty and that ambiguity and, and choose certainty instead. And, you know, what history tells us is that sometimes people will give away their freedom to get certainty in the moment because it's preferable to the, the pain and, and suffering and distress that comes with uncertainty. And I, yeah. I think that, you know, so I think that actually adding, not replacing um, social and psychological levels of explanation with biology, but I think adding the biology, the layer actually helps knit together some things that, you know, we didn't necessarily think of as being related before. Yeah, this is perfectly in line with um, a framework that I've uh, been using to try to understand some of this, uh, the framework of psychological entropy, mm. you know, that like Jacob Hirsch and uh, Raymond Marr and Jordan Peterson proposed. Did you read their paper, Psychological Entropy, a Framework for Understanding Uncertainty Related Anxiety? I did. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Awesome. I, I assume you're very well read in the literature. I was wondering what you thought of it, um, sort of applying some of these free energy principles and things that are used in any self-organizing system, but to the brain level of analysis and, and human psychology. Yeah. So I think the idea of psychological entropy is is a good metaphor, like body budgeting is a good metaphor for the biological process of allostasis. I don't know that Carl Friston and and there's like a whole, you know, a whole generation of people talking about free energy. And to be honest, um, I don't, I got a C in high school physics, you know, I couldn't even pass high, you know, college level physics. It was just not for me. So I really prefer to deal with things at the biological level. I, I can't get down to the, to the, to the fit level of physics to be honest. So I'm, I'm kind of joking there, but I'm also kind of not joking. I don't know enough really. And I don't understand the math, even with my engineering colleagues to help me. Um, they often don't understand the math <laughs> that they read in these papers. So, I, you know, I'm not saying the entropy, the psychological entropy, paper, but the, I'm talking about the, you know, predictive coding paper. So um, mm. I don't know at that level, but I do know that, that I think psychological entropy is a good, it's a good metaphor for what's happening at the level of the brain, which is that why do we even predict, why do brains even predict in the first place? And the answer is to reduce uncertainty. It's to reduce ambiguity because you can't, you're there. The whole point of a nervous system is to figure out what to do next. And if you can't mm -hmm. figure that out, it's really expensive metabolically and you might die. So, you know, because you might not, protect or you might miss, you know, uh, getting food or, or whatever. So, um, so I would say, I, I don't know about the, the, the details of the mechanistic analysis, but I like the metaphor quite a bit. Yeah, me too. And I wouldn't, yeah, claim to have fully understand and, and have comprehension over how free energy uh, principle works in thermodynamic systems. <laughs> don't ask me yeah, to draw a diagram. Yeah, I just don't. I'm not, you know, I'm like, I believe, I <laughs> yeah. believe, you know, the second law of thermodynamics or whatever. I, mean, I don't know. Exactly. You know, I, I, I take it for granted that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and I mean, it's sort of the same thing as, um, you know, like quantum mechanics, you know, like 
I love Carlo Rovelli's writing because it, it makes sense to me. It describes, you know, quantum mechanics as this rela- in, in relational terms. So nothing has a meaning except in relation to something else. And that to me make, makes a lot of sense. Actually, it's really consistent with um, the constructionist approach that we take. But don't ask me to read the math, man. I just can't. I, I, you know, that I, I'm not at that level really of, um, being able to do that, but the, but the ideas make a lot of sense to me. Totally. And one level of analysis that it really interests me when we talk about how the brain is a prediction machine is the effect of early childhood trauma on brain wiring, especially during vulnerable periods, uh, critical periods of brain development. A metaphor that really struck me as uh, ringing true is this uh, idea that our brain does a weather forecast to a certain degree. If we are raised in very unstable and unpredictable and harsh and harsh and unpredictable environments growing up, that that does have certain effects on brain development that can cause us to sort of expect that the world will be unfair or unsafe in the future and that that process has to be actively unlearned uh, through through therapy, lots of therapy. That's why we're all in therapy as adults, you know, or especially people who've gone through trauma um, to actively unlearn that because fear learning and fear unlearning operate in, in different systems of the brain. So I just want to just get some of your thoughts on some of what I just said. Do you, do you like that metaphor of kind of the weather forecast metaphor of early childhood trauma? And uh, yeah, just what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think all brain function can be described as a, as um, weather forecast. Yeah. And in fact, yeah. a number of years ago, I actually wrote a, an opinion piece that um, talked about maps of the brain and made analogies to weather maps versus to, you know, nice. geographic maps and so on and so forth. But I guess it makes sense. But I, the way that I talk about it actually is to use the idea from psychology of an internal model human brains are not born complete they're born under construction so a little infant brain is not a miniature adult brain it's it's a brain that's waiting for wiring instructions from the world and it gets those wiring instructions through the sensory surfaces of your body so some of the like your brain is wired to the sh- your shape that you have and the wideness of your eyes. And, you know, it's mm. wired by the sense data that it receives. It's also wired by the, um, you know, variations in temperature and in light and in, co- uh, you know, warmth and, and, and also by social um interaction so how much does a person make eye contact with the infant how much does the person how much does a caregiver speak to the infant like all of these things actually influence um wiring um of the brain and basically what the brain is doing is it's bootstrapping into itself um, a model of its body in the world and so if a child experiences adversity over a prolonged period of time, or even it could just be one really intense instance of adversity, um, that becomes part of the child's model, by the brain's Mm -hmm. model. And that's what the brain uses to predict the future, um, which becomes the present. Your predictions, in a sense, you know, are always the result of past experience in some way. Oftentimes, it's your own personal experience, but it could be you know, the stories that you hear from other people or the things that you see on TV or um, the books that you read or the movies that you see or the stuff you look at um, on YouTube or whatever, you know, because humans, we don't have to experience everything ourselves. We, we also can learn from other people. Adversity, if it's prolonged or profound, will that brain's wire themselves to function in those circumstances. And that's the, that's the model of the world, of the body in the world that the brain takes forward into new environments. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, but I, the only thing I want to say was, I don't think you, you don't really ever unlearn anything. You just learn new things. And so, mm. the, I mean, the evidence, you know, suggests that old learning never goes away it just becomes contextual, you know, it's just becomes contextualized. 
So you learn new things. It doesn't replace the old learning. It just um, um, exists alongside it. And this just sort of gets back to your point about like, why do we have a big neocortex? And the answer is because we don't unlearn things. I mean, that's why we have a big neocortex so that we have lifetime memories that we can use to predict the future. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's so fascinating when you really think about it, really uh, concretely. The fact that our brain is stuck in this dark encasement. <laughs> it doesn't have like it's not, and and it's like trying to, you know, through how many years of human, uh, well, not just human evolution, but of of organism evolution, it's taking everything it's it's learned throughout the whole. St- you know, to try to fi- predict and figure out like, okay, well, that's happening. Well, we know that like, y- there's a probability that this is, pr- you know, and that's why we, we might jump at the, at something that's actually not, s- once we process it, we're like, okay, well, that wasn't actually scary. You know, we'll see something like run across the floor, you know, be like, ah, you know, it's like the brain predicting that, right? That that we should be scared by that. But it's just, it's just so, it's so me. I mean, it's such a, it, it's all, isn't it all inspiring, you know, to think about, you know, just how, like how much is built in that actually does allow us to function reasonably well you know some it depends on my day but um you know uh, well enough to be able to um to take in all this information and have you know such quick you know reactions you know i have to say that um after as i was writing seven and a half lessons about the brain i um it really changed how i look at little infants, <laughs> you, know, like you look at these little helpless little creatures and there's a, it's remarkable what's happening inside the, that skull, you know? Um, and yeah, I mean, I have certainly used the phrasing um, that, um, you know, your brain is stuck in a dark silent box and um, it's receiving sense data from your body and from the world. Um, so, you know, there's a change in air pressure um, which you experience as a sound of like, you know, like a loud bang. So what is that loud bang? What caused that loud bang? Is it a car door slamming? Is it thunder? Is it a gunshot? You know, whatever the cause is will in will lead, you know, that's what's going to dictate what you do next. But you don't have access to the cause. You only have access to the consequence, to the outcome. So your brain has to guess at the cause. And what does it use to guess? It uses past experience. So um, you can't escape using past experience. It, if you if you do, you you are experientially blind to what to what you're presented with. But what you can do is you can cultivate new experiences for yourself um, that essentially seed your brain to predict differently in the future. So mm-hmm. you're by doing this, you're basically cultivating your past. You know, mm. you can't reach back into your past and change it. I mean, you can go into therapy and you can try to remodel, do a little remodeling, you know, but you can't really re-architect your past. What you can do, though, is cultivate experiences for yourself in the future that are novel, um, that are instructive, that are essentially like cultivating a new past because once you've experienced it, it's learned and it's there and it's available to be used in in the future. So oftentimes well, the way I think of it is it's kind of like exercise, you know, cultivating a new experience for yourself can be scary, painful, uncomfortable. It can also be joyful, but, you know, it's energetically costly. But so is exercise. You're kind of making an investment in, in, in who you'll be in the future. That's poetic, yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure. So, yeah. Well, this is this is a major theme of your book is that there are a lot of things we can, you know, that we can do to um, influence our our mind, you know, and and the patterns, you know, and uh, which does change, you know. There's a, a reciprocal thing there. That, well, okay, I don't want to get too implicit dualism here, but I wrote something on Twitter, like um, I wrote something like 
a seemingly innocuous comment like it's very interesting to me that how you know it's not just as though the brain produces one a mind it produces multiple minds and it's really interesting to me how through the course of human evolution you know some of these minds evolve for different purposes it's amazing how do we make any decisions <laughs> you know like when we have all these things and people were wrote things like well how do you know it's the brain producing the mind how do you know it's not the mind producing the brain and i'm like well and, and i'm like well you know look as a cognitive scientist i assume a couple of things you know or else i what is the purpose of my job if i don't assume them one the thing i assume is that the mind and brain are intricately connected that and that the former that the mind depends on the brain <laughs> i mean isn't that a reasonable assumption well of course it is because we're scientists i think well, the yeah. way i think about it is that well let me first just say that this mm. idea of does the mind influence the brain in philosophy yeah. is called you, you probably know this called the downward causation problem so mm. so um the way I think about it is that the mind is what the brain is doing in a particular moment in time. And the mind is constituted as a set of mental features. It's like the psychological features, the experiential features in a given brain um, state or where the brain is in its state space to be technical. So it's not like you have a mind and you have a brain and you somehow have to figure out how these two right. realms relate to each other. <clears throat> you have a brain and your brain conjures, constructs mental features. And those mental features are your mind at that moment. <laughs> and that's it. There's really nothing. And, you know, so, but what you do in the moment. So for example, if I smile at you or I scowl at you or, um, you know, whatever I do, or actually it's what your brain predicts I'll do influences what you do next. So, and that influences me. So this is, um, you know, you, so your so mental features can influence brain wiring. There is downward causation in that sense. Um, in fact, uh, one of the postdocs in our lab, a uh, brilliant guy uh, named Jordan um, Terrio, um, uh, he um, published a paper about, um, a sense of should like why do people you know why do people feel moral obligation why do they follow social rules like what's the value of that why do that and the answer is and it's all laid out with math and you know um is that if i make myself predictable to you mm. then you are more predictable to me and you being predictable to me is metabolically you know um beneficial to me again coming back to uncertainty versus predictability wouldn't it be good if like the growth trajectory of most human relationships was, oh, we're starting to really understand each other's uh, being, you know? Well, I mean, that's a really complicated uh, question, but yeah. I, I partly what I would say is that um, in, well, I say this as a clinician, but probably also as a person, um, you know, it's hard. It sounds, it's going to sound really pop psyche, but I actually think it's true. Um, you know, you can't really get to know somebody else really well if you don't know yourself really well. And in my mm -hmm. experience, people lie to each other less than they lie to themselves. So, <laughs> so you know, oftentimes in conversations, I'm sure you've had this experience, you know, it's like you're a platform for the person to perform who they believe they are. They're not really having a conversation with you. They're just you know, like I often feel like when I'm in a situation like that, where I, I want to say, who are you saying this for? Like, are you saying this for me? Or are you saying this for yourself? Like, I, you know, who's this for? Who is this? You know, what's this for? Love it. So I think when there's discord in relationships, it's often because, um, you know, people are unaware they're, that they're, you know, they're unaware Projecting. of their own. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love it. Um, well, you do say in uh, in your book, uh, your brain secretly works with other brains. I think this really, this principle relates to some of the, the things we're throwing around right now and concepts. My friend Annie Murphy Paul, the journalist, wrote a really uh, brilliant book that just came out called The Extended Mind, which mm -hmm. drew on the work of Dave Chalmers and Andy Clark. Uh, did do you have you have do you seen that book? Uh, I've seen the book, book and it's on my pile um, of books to read at the beach. <laughs> so cool. I allow yeah. myself, I, when I go to the beach for two weeks every year and I only read novels and I allow myself one science book, one, just one. 
um, because I'm reading science all the rest of the year, you know, so that's a contender. Yeah. So on my pile, right, but, right there. But you're, but you're obviously familiar with the, you know, the extended mind hypothesis and, um, Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But you know, I mean, you're, you're probably really familiar with lots of scientific, um, work, but it's really fun to, and sometimes infuriating, but mostly fun to, um, see how people see what they do with it um, when they're um, communicating to the public. So um, I oh, love totally. reading popular science. I mean, I, 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 before I wrote how emotions are made, I probably read 50 popular science books just to see kind of like how people did it. And um, yeah, you know what I wanted to do and what I didn't want to do and, and try to figure that out. But it's, it's fun to see how people handle these really complicated topics. Um, it's fun to see the metaphors that they use and to think about them and play with them a little bit. Well, I do think, you know, your book, uh, Seven and a Half, your most recent book, um, is can be likened to Hawkins' seminal uh, guide to the universe. You know, I do think wow. it is the Thank equivalent you. for the brain. No, I think you did it. So, Congratulations! Wow. That's um, yeah. that's high, yeah. that's that's very high praise. I'm yeah. very grateful for that comment. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're very welcome. Yeah, and I think that it's also very there is a practical element to this book. I mean, you are making the case that the brain, our brains, can create our reality to a certain degree. You know, you're not going all postmodern there and <laughs> saying that that uh, to 100 percent. You know, 100 percent. We all have live in our own realities. Uh, we don't want to live in that world. We want to have some. We do want to have some shared collective reality. But but that we can modify. You know, our our predictive valences, our probabilities. You know, and, and to get really nerdy in, about phrasing it. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. I would now at this point like to move into the emotions part and, uh, you know, kind of end on, on that discussion because I find your theory so provocative. Uh, and I find it provocative because it does challenge even my own standard ways of thinking about emotions. Um, even ways I still think about emotion. It's, I can't just get rid of it <laughs> overnight. <laughs> and, and so let me tell you some ways I think about emotions. You tell me why I'm wrong <laughs> or maybe tell me why it's not, well, more nuanced. Tell me why it's incomplete. <laughs> That's really how scientists talk. We don't say you're wrong, but. You know, for instance, I'm interested in like emotional intelligence and that, that field of research and its correlation with general intelligence and IQ. But there is a, a basic assumption in the emotional intelligence literature that people differ. There's individual differences in people's ability to uh, identify emotions. There's even a whole test, you know, reading the emotions in the eyes test. You know, people with autism uh, have greater difficulty with it, you know, like Simon Baron Cohen's research, et cetera, uh, other people's research on that, that there is kind of, there are some implicit assumptions here that there, there are, um, you know, universally evolutionary evolved emotions that people differ in their ability to label, you know, cross culturally. Now, the more I read your research and really dig into it and understand the nuances of it, because I do think I do understand it finally. I've, I've really, it took me a couple of years to finally really wrap my head around what you're saying, just because it's a very complex theory. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it does present a, a little bit of a different view on that. Am I right? Yes, it does. So let <laughs> or me, a lot um, different. <laughs> a lot different. Yeah. So let me let me say that um, let's take the mind and the eyes test. Okay. So here's how the mind and the eyes test works. You show a set of eye, like two eyes, from a photograph, just the eyes, and then you have four words that you give the subject or the respondent or this patient, and then they have to pick the word that matches the eyes and best and when you do this you see what looks like universal um agreement um yeah. that looks like something that it's innate because how else could it be universal and well, not only that but there's only one correct answer on the test i mean like the, the whole assumption well, of the test is like c is fear yeah but yeah. right but i would but i'm not even at that point yet i haven't even got to okay. that point yet. okay okay um but i will get there in a minute <laughs> um cool and that is um what happens when you take those words away and you just get people to free label? What do you, what is this person experiencing? Do you, do you know what you get? I think people approximate what the, 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 what the psychologist deemed the correct answer, but you're saying no? 
No, they don't. I published a paper on this actually a couple of years ago. Well, good. This is is why we need science. (laughs) Absolutely not. No. And in fact, it's the same thing with emotion perception studies. If you give a scowling face and or a smiling face or whatever, and you give a set of words and the subject has to choose, the respondent has to choose a word to match the face, you get what looks like universal agreement as long as you're testing people from urban cultures. When you test people from remote cultures, the whole the whole ball game changes. You don't get anything like anything universal, but you do get something that looks a, uh, like universality when you're testing people in large urban cultures around the world. But what happens when you test Americans? Just Americans, when you take the words away, you don't see anything that looks like universality. Do, do, do you see in terms of semantic distance? Like, you, do you see like if someone's like that, like people say they're happy? Do you know what I mean? You see like, valence. What you see is valence. Yeah. That people are okay. basically around the world, and even in even in remote cultures, people um, seem to um, distinguish valence and sometimes arousal. Mm. Um, I'm not saying valence and arousal are universal. I'm just saying that's what you see. Okay. And mm. when you look at patients, for example, who have semantic dementia. Um, they can do. They can sort faces on the basis, you know. So you give them a bunch of faces, and you ask them to sort them. They can sort on valence and arousal, but they can't sort on anger, sad, fear, disgust. Like if you can't access words and the meanings of words, you uh, can't recognize fear or anger or sadness. Recognize, and then the point that you were getting at, which is well, it's accurate. How is accuracy assessed? I mean, it, within emotion research, these are posed faces. These are not naturalistic expressions that people make. These are posed faces. They're all posed faces. And in fact, when you do research with naturalistic faces, what you you don't see anything mm-hmm. like um, uh, the um, what looks like universality. And the reason why is that research suggests, again, in urban cultures, that People scowl when they're angry about 30% of the time. Now, that's not chance. That's better than chance. But it means that 70% of the time they're doing something else that's meaningful with their face to express anger. And that's low reliability from a scientific standpoint. And people also scowl when they're not angry. They scowl when they're confused. They scowl when they're concentrating really hard. They scowl when they have gas. That's low specificity. So mm. the point here is that when it comes to, you know, the expression of emotion, variability is the norm. And most of the time when you see universe evidence of universality, it's constructed um, by these really constrained tests that actually are using artificial stimuli. So how, how does... Simon Baron Cohen know that the person in the photograph with the eyes was, you know, thoughtful or was sad or was, how does he know? Where, where's the criterion? As far as I know, there's no scientifically objective criterion for any of those words that anybody's ever been able to produce reliably across samples. So the, there are a whole scaffold of assumptions which once you start poking at those assumptions, you, um, you know, the whole thing falls apart like a house of cards, really. Well, well, that's very, very revolutionary because Paul Ekman's, you know, studies are taught in almost every introductory psychology textbook. You know, I'm um, very aware. Of that. <laughs> you're aware of this. I mean, look, Paul. I mean, Paul Ekman argued there's six universal basic emotions: anger, surprise, disgust, enjoyment, fear, and sadness. I'm not teaching you this, but this is for my audience. I'm teaching my audience this. Um, uh, and he's, you know, argued it's universal. You know, he's gone to every you know every culture in the world and, no he hasn't he, uh, actually, but he has it so, but he hasn't but no, this is how I it's mean, taught so this I, is how it's taught yeah no yeah. yeah exactly so this is sort of the problem of textbooks right um the problem yeah. of textbooks is that um they um they distill information and they often um errors that are made are often carried forward and you know like if you go we did a little um study um of how is william james like i i I learned 
uh, when I was in intro psych and even later that William James proposed that each emotion like anger, sad, fear, and so on has its own physical pattern associated with it. Mm. If you go back and you read William James, like read, read the principles of psychology. He says the opposite of that. Mm. So I'm like, how, how did that happen? (laughs) Like how, how can you say one, you write one thing, over and over again, like in his book and in a couple of papers, and it gets morphed somehow into the James Lang theory. That's like a Frankenstein. Mm. I mean, Lang actually believed that there was one vasomotor, one physical pattern for anger, sad, fear. But James believed that there were multiple feelings of anger, and every feeling of anger, every variation of anger had its own uh, physical comportment. So he's saying there is no essence of physical essence of anger. It's a variety, you know, he's, and so how does that happen? Right. And part of what we did was we went and we looked at intro psych textbooks and, um, you know, I'm saying this for my, my lovely friends who write intro psych textbooks, <laughs> you know, they it's try a profitable really hard. business, by the way, it's a profitable business and they try really hard. They, they try hard to keep updating, but you know, It takes a couple of years for information to make its way into the um, textbooks. And in the case of emotion, I'll say, all I can say is that the evidence, I mean, Paul Ekman's work was revolutionary for its time. And he and his colleagues did fantastic work for their time. But they and so I don't want to, you know, all of us, whether we, we agree with, with someone or disagree, we stand on the shoulders of those giants, okay? And so um, that's not to be diminished. Yeah. But Paul Ekman sure. went to a couple of, couple of remote cultures. He didn't go all over the world. And in fact, he didn't go to many of the places that, um, and it's not a criticism, it's just, he, you know, maybe it wasn't possible to do that then. But, um, you know, they were all in, in and around pa- Papua New Guinea. Uh, you know, um, for the most part, you know, in in Southeast Asia, they weren't in Africa and in all like all of these other you know um, parts of the world. And one of my former students actually published a review of all of the studies on remote cultures, including our own. Right, so we've been to two mm-hmm. remote cultures including um, studying the Hadza hunter gatherers in, in Tanzania. And um, what you can see is that all of the studies that have been published in the last, I want to say maybe less than 10 years, all replicate each other, but they swamp the evidence from those early studies. So those early studies relied on very specific methods that, didn't allow for certain discoveries to be made. And when you use a variety of methods in a variety of cultures uh, with a variety of different constraints, you don't find universality. You just don't. I mean, that's revolutionary. Have you, have you talked to, have you ever talked to Ackman? Have you ever been like, what do you think of my constructed theory of emotions? Yeah. Yeah, So that's a really interesting question. So, um, you know, when I was writing How Emotions Are Made, the there's a chapter in there about, you know, emotional expression and emotion perception and and um and it's called constructing universality. <laughs> constructing no, universal it. emotions. And but you know, I was thinking like if I were him, I would be worrying about what is this person gonna say. You know, because he's been attacked so many times, and that's not my goal. He's been called right? fascist, not- you know, by yeah. anthropologists. So I, yeah. yeah, exactly. So I thought to myself, well, if I were him, I'd be pretty worried. And so I wrote him an email, and I said, listen, I just, you know, I just want to tell you. Um, and he knew that I was writing the book because I asked to use some of the photographs of his photographs of faces, I had to get permission to use them in the book, right? And so I basically sent him a personal email and I said, listen, um, maybe you're worried, maybe you're not, but maybe you are. And if you are, I'm gonna tell you exactly what I'm gonna say, you know? 
And maybe you're worried that I'm going to say, you know, this guy's an idiot. He's totally, you know, off his rocker. He's, you know, you know, his science is bullshit, you know, but I'm not going to say that. I just want to be really clear with you. That's actually not what I'm going to say. Here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say that you discovered something important, but it's not what you think you discovered. I think you discovered something else. I think you discovered the power of words actually to teach people emotion categories really quickly. Mm. Um, that's mm. what those studies actually show. Because, you know, if you give people, even in remote cultures, it's a little fuzzier. But in, in urban cultures, you give people emotion words and they can use them. They're learning how to use them in the task. And mm. they can learn really fast. Words, and you can see this even in infants, words are invitations to learn abstract categories. And that's what I think he showed inadvertently by the methods that he was using. But anyways, my point is that, you know, I just reached out to him and, um, you know, we had a nice chat over email. He responded? Was, he responded? He did. He responded really wow. positively and warmly um, wow. and said, you know, thank you so much. And I'm really grateful. And, you know, maybe we should have a chat. And, you know, maybe. And I so I said, yeah, I would love to have a chat. Why don't we? Um, you know, James Gross and I, uh, a few years before that, um, who studies emotion regulation at um, Stanford, and you know, he um, and I do not hold exactly the same views on emotion. And um, but we founded the Society for Affective Science together with some of our colleagues. Mm -hmm. And so I said, why don't we have a chat at SAS at the conference, and we can have Bob Levinson, who's a very close colleague of Paul's, and I, I consider him a very good friend of mine. He's been very supportive, and um, I don't, you know, he and I don't necessarily see eye to eye on the way that we interpret the evidence, but we can, we have perfectly reasonable conversations about it, um, and we learn from each other, and so on. Um, you know, why don't we have it? Why don't we have a conversation there? And, you know, mm. he thought that that was a great idea, but it never came to pass, unfortunately. So, well, if I can do anything to, uh, if you ever want to have like a discussion on the psychology podcast, I bring like three people together or something, you know, for like thousands of people to be able to listen to, let me know. <laughs> I, you know, I would love that, but I will tell you that for the most part, um, We've done debates before. I had a debate with Dr. Mm. Keltner at one meeting. I mm. had uh, we had a panel debate with um, a number of I can't even remember all the people who were there. We've done these things before, and in general, people are not comfortable. As a general rule, my colleagues are not comfortable with that kind of format. We we mm. at at the Society for Affective Science, the conference still goes on. And I mean, James and I are not at the helm anymore. You know, we gave it away to our, to our colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we introduced lots of different mechanisms for people to have these conversations. Like we, we invented salons, which are, you know, you stick a purse, a scientist in a room with cookies and coffee, and anyone can come for an hour and ask them anything they want. You know, like Ralph Adolphs and I did a salon uh, together recently um where you know he he very much is on the side of you know basic emotions so to speak and that's what it's called in the field and you know he and i um have debated each other twice in public um we wrote a paper together actually on facial expressions where he agreed i mean the four four scientists five it was it i guess five of us from very different theoretical backgrounds decided to write a paper, we're invited really to write a paper on are, are ex emotional expressions universal. And so for two and a half years, we, um, we met over Zoom. This was before COVID. Um, we um, read over a thousand papers. We summarized the evidence from adults across cultures, from children across cultures, from, I mean, just, you know, lots and lots and lots of evidence. Three of my colleagues believed in universality before we started the process. And at the end of the process, we were so concerned that we wouldn't be able to come to consensus that we came up with contingency plans just in case um, uh, what we would do because we were invited to write a single paper. So we were like, well, can we write two papers or can we write one paper in a dialogue or can we, you know, like we're, we were sort of anticipating that we would not be able to come to consensus. Um, 
but we did come to consensus. So, um, so Wait, Ralph, what was the consensus? that there is no universality and that, wow. you know, um, and that paper is freely available. It's was written for the, you know, it's called in a journal called psychological science for, in the public interest. So it's, um, uh, it's available freely um, from uh, the Association for Psychological Science, or you can just go to my academic website. It's there for free. Um, but my point is that, you know, Ralph and I disagree on some things, but we agree on other things um, because Ralph yeah. is somebody who responds to the data, you know, and we've yeah. even written, uh, you know, pieces together, but that's rare, you know, but that's mm. rare in general. So if somebody wants to have that discussion on your podcast, I think that would be fantastic. But I will tell mm. you that, I mean, I'm sure Ralph would do it, but we've, we talked to each other. <laughs> we've talked to each other. We got to get Ekman in you. I got to get Ekman in you. Well, he's very, you know, he's, he's, um, he's not, my, I don't know him, uh, personally, but my understanding is he's not well and he's, you know, he's mm -hmm. aged. So uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know that he would want to do it, but certainly if he wanted to do it, I'd be delighted to do it. Yeah. There are so many implications of your research for so many swaths of uh, the field that I work in. Now, almost to the degree that it's like, if I go full in, and I'm not full in on your theory, but if I, if, let's say I become like a full disciple <laughs> of your theory, like, that means that the way I, like, I talk to my colleagues, like, I need, I have to tell a lot of people to stop, to change the way they think about it. So let's take two fields evolutionary psychology and positive psychology, two fields that I work in. Okay. Now in the field of evolutionary psychology, it's just everywhere. Uh, evolutionary of the evolutionary evolved function of sadness, you know, the modularity of the mating motive, you know, the, the emotion we feel when, you know, love, but then, you know, in positive psychology, there's the whole class of emotions called positive emotions. Um, and that's like, you know, as though like, they're that's they're absolutely these are the positive emotions and then then these other ones are not the positive emotions so everywhere i look you know once i look through the lens of your theory i start to see things very very differently and so can you explain a little bit what you mean when you say emotions are learned and and the difference between emotions and affect and then can you talk at all about you know the implications for a lot of these ideas in positive psychology and evolutionary psychology i know these are big questions i'm asking you do you do you mind you know, I just want people to pay attention to I the know. evidence. That's it. Just pay attention to the evidence and pay attention to what your experiments, the way they're designed, allow you to discover and what they preclude you from discovering by virtue of how you've designed them and the assumptions that you've made. So here's what I would say. Your brain is always regulating your body and your body's always sending sense data back to your brain. You don't experience the sense data that's coming from your body to your brain in high dimensional detail. Because if you did, you would never pay attention to anything outside your skin ever again. Mm. You experience the interoceptive environment of your body, the sense data from your body to your brain, your brain's modeling of the state of your body as affect. So affect is kind of feeling pleasant, feeling unpleasant, feeling worked up, feeling calm, feeling like you have energy, feeling like really fatigued. Affect is, you can think of it as like a barometer for um, your body budget, for allostasis is the technical mm. term. So um, your brain is always regulating your body. Your body is always sending sense data back to your brain. Your brain's always modeling the state of your body. And so affect is a property of consciousness. It's always with you. Sometimes it's in the foreground. If you're experiencing it, you know, front and center because it's very intense. Sometimes it's in the background, but it's always there. Mm. Your brain is constantly striving to make sense, constantly making sense of sense data. Always, whether it's emotion or anything else. It's just, you know, you mm. are receiving sense data constantly through the sensory services of your body your eyes, your ears, your nose, and inside your body, there are sensory services all sending information to the brain. These are the causes. These are, sorry, the consequences or the outcomes of some set of causes. Your brain doesn't know the causes. That's an inverse problem. And the way the brain solves the inverse problem is by drawing on past experience to make a guess at the cause. And it's doing it predictively. So when your, game, when your brain guesses that the cause 
of a tug in your chest is anxiety because in the past in this context in this situation that's what it was then your brain's constructing anxiety you experience it as anxiety it's not a fable or whatever it's your that's how you experience that tug in your chest but you can deconstruct that tug in your chest but you can deconstruct the feeling of anxiety into just a mere tug in your chest that's what mindfulness meditation teaches you to do right so the analogy that i give often is that if i want to paint this glass which is a three-dimensional object and i want to render it on a two-dimensional surface one thing i could do is i could just see the glass in its three-dimensional glory and try to draw it on a two-dimensional surface. And what you'll get is a pretty shitty looking two-dimensional drawing. But if I take this glass and I try to parse it apart into little pieces of light, so I'm deconstructing it into pieces of light. And then I, so I can see a little bit of blue and a little bit of green and a little bit of silver and a little bit of white. And, you know, and I take these pieces like this long strip of green here and I render these pieces individually on the page, then you get a pretty decent looking three-dimensional object. Except if you're me, because I can't paint. Then it still looks crappy. But the point is that you can teach yourself to deconstruct into data that's closer to the sense data, that's not as constructed. And you can do that even with your emotions. And I have to tell you, I just had I'm recovering from spinal surgery. You can do it with pain. And in fact, Eric Garland, a scientist who has these fabulous studies showing that chronic pain can be deconstructed into discomfort and distress. So you can get rid of the distress and just experience the discomfort. And that alone reduces your opioid dependence if, if you're suffering from chronic pain. So emotions are constructed the way every other perception is constructed, the way objects are constructed, the way thoughts are constructed, everything you experience is constructed in part by what's going on outside your head and what's going on inside your head. And emotions are no different and the mechanisms are no different. So okay. where does the learning from, uh, where does the learning come from? Like where do these past experiences of emotion come from? Well, they come from other people labeling your, labeling events for you as sad or angry or as giggle or as, um, you know, ligat or whatever the emotion categories are that are relevant to your cultural context. I get it. <laughs> Thank you so much for that explanation. And I uh, look, this is what I'm thinking. What's might be going on in the literature? It's a different way of thinking about the reading, the mind, and the eyes test. But um, you know, I'm really interested in individual differences, and 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 it's undeniable that the, some of those tests are predictive of um well less social awkwardness for sure you know but also it it, it can predict lots of things it can predict psychopathology it can predict but why does it psychopathy no and uh, sure, that's where i'm going with why? this yeah this is what i'm about to say this is what i'm about to say so i think that um based on your theory and i, I, I could see it i think it may it makes sense is that probably the individual differences variable there is um, your ability to to understand the socialization processes, the 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 norm rule structure, you know, like like have you been able to learn in your society that that that's like when someone sounds like that, you don't say why are you happy today, you know that that's like so that's cold that's like a taboo, a, a a social taboo, and that people like on the autism spectrum because I I have studied that topic i study neurodiversity and i i am very interested in autism for in particular is that um you know a lot of them um have a, a bias um where they don't look people in the eyes you know and and that, and that seems to be a source of information but but the question is maybe it, with your theory it's a source of information that allows you to negotiate with the cultural uh, norms um that have set forth so we associate certain eye information with what we've been taught about what that means um is that what you would say something like what i would say what i would say is that um that Gaze is very important um, in humans because that's how we regulate a, each other's attention. So if I mm -hmm. look away and then I look back to you, you know, you're you're likely to look where I looked. And so um, part of mm -hmm. part of what we do with gaze is we regulate, we we sort of gesture to each other what is important and what is not important. What can you ignore as 
as noise and what do you have to pay attention to as signal. So it's partly directing learning in this very social way. But also, um, there are other problems, you know, in autism, people on the spectrum, they also, their brains are not wired in a way to allow them to do abstraction very well. And if they can't do abstraction very well, if they're very concrete, not a criticism, it's just an observation, then they can't use words as invitations to form abstract concepts. So they're going to have trouble using words. Oh, wow. The way, and so that's why they can't, that's why they can't do the, eye, the mind and the eyes test. You know, if you take a person... Well, language is a deficit. Yeah. yeah. If you take... I mean, language is... It's not magic, okay? But if you take a three-month-old, a three-month-old, and you say to that three-month-old, look, honey, this is a blurg. And then you put it down and the blurg, you know, the pencil, you know, makes a noise, like a beep. And then you say, look, honey, this is a blurg. You put it down, it makes a beep. And then you take this and you say, look, honey, this is a blurg. So what happens? The baby expects this to beep. All these things, they look different, they sound different, they, but they're functionally the same because uh, that's what the word is telling the baby. There's a function there that's the same. It beeps. And that is a very, very simple illustration of how words are really powerful for learning abstractions that in our big brains that can do all that compression um, that some non-neurotypical brains have challenges with. So what I would say is that many of our treatments for psychopathology and many of our tests work predictively to some degree, but they don't work for the reasons that people think. And why does that matter? Well, that's so interesting. That matters because we really need, to, if we really want to prevent illness and we want to enhance thriving and so on, then we need to understand the mechanisms better. And that, that, that's what motivates me um, to do the work that I do. Um, I'm just really data driven, actually. So, um, and if you just follow the scientific method and you try to prove you try to find places where you're wrong. Like, you know, when I first started um, doing work on emotion, I would say to people, tell me what you think the best evidence is. Tell me what you think the best evidence is that there are innate circuits in the brain for emotion. And then I would go and I would read every single thing that they told me. In fact, we even invited Yak Panksep for a month to come to Boston College where I worked. He came and we, for a month, every day, we, we, we met every day for a month. We ran a seminar and we went through every piece of evidence that he had. So I think all you have to do is be as skeptical about your own ideas as other people's ideas and be open to every shred of data that's available and look outside your own comfort zone to other fields, which make other assumptions that you don't make. And if your hypotheses are robust, they will be sustained. And if they're not, they won't. And science, I mean, I don't know. I just, I don't, I'm sure you agree. I mean, I just feel like science is not about being right. It's about figuring out how things work and it's okay to be wrong. But you know, if you're going to be wrong, I want to know if I'm wrong. You know, I really want to know if I'm wrong. Because um, I, it matters. I, to, you don't. You can't help people if you don't. You know. If you're. If you don't know the veracity of what you're saying. Yeah, I love. I love everything that you're saying. It just this debate seems to be so reminiscent of so many debates in cognitive science that get to the level of is it a general learning mechanism or is it a do it's domain specific system in the brain it could be likened to the the great language debate you know um uh between yes. chomsky and um and i actually take more an arthur reber point of view uh, which that was my whole dissertation um, my whole cognitive science dissertation was on implicit learning and i tried to show that um some of these domain general learning mechanisms could explain some of the uh 
intelligence um, that had been explained by more domain specific views. It just seems to me like we keep repeating these de- these debates in the field of cognitive science over and over, and in, in, in you know, and and I, I see this as another one, you know. Yeah, you you are a hundred and fifty percent correct. Yeah. And what yeah. I so what I think is really interesting is. Um, So what is it about the human mind, right, or the human brain that leads us always to these, you know, like, you know, so, for example, if you look at Buddhist philosophy, right, um, people say, oh, it's very non-essentialist. No, no, well, actually, no, it isn't. Um, It's very non-essentialist about the self, but the Abhidharma states that this is, you know, what the Dalai Lama follows, that... um, there are, there are dharmas and those dharmas are essences and they are indivisible. Like they are, they are the, they are the essences of consciousness. And then along comes, you know, a couple of centuries later, this guy named Dharma Kirti. He says, Oh no, 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 no. Dharmas are constructed by the human mind with con- human concepts. <laughs> That's like the whole debate right there. Just summed up. Yeah. And it's like, you know, and, but look, it's like a different yeah. culture. It's a different time. So this idea of domain general versus domain specific or, systems versus modules or you know mm. essences or i guess yeah. essences versus whatever you know you get my point there's a there's i do there's some yeah it's come it comes up again and again and again which leads you to think like in a meta science kind of way what is it about human explanation you know causal explanations that lead us always in the end to these two choices and so I think it re- must reveal something about the way that we think and and maybe even something universal because it keeps going. <laughs> it comes up in many domains it comes up in many cultures in many time uh you know historical times you know there's something about the way that our brain um processes information that leads us to these different ways of um thinking about the world even physics you see it in physics I mean It's just, you know, Newtonian physics versus, you know, quantum mechanics. It's just, there's something really interesting there. Well, I'll bring this whole full circle and then I'll, uh, I'll end the interview because I, I want to be respectful of your time. But uh, to bring it all full circle, I think what it is, is it goes back to your whole idea that the brain is a prediction machine. And I think it's a need for order. It's a need, you know, when you can systematize things, when you can break things down in a domain specific sort of way as in discrete things, it actually reduces our psychological entropy. And, and scientists are humans too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, for sure. And in fact, there's a, a, there's actually a chapter about this. And I wrote about this actually in how emotions are made where I didn't use mm-hmm. the phrase um, psychological entropy because I don't think the paper had been published at that point. But um, mm-hmm. I took a, took a quote from, I think it was, Alan Lightman, maybe, or there's some really great quote. I think it's Alan Lightman, the physicist Alan Lightman, who said, scientists love to put things into boxes and tidy little boxes with little names. And it really makes us feel better. It makes us feel like we've learned something about the world. And, you know, and um, again, I would say it's the reduction of uncertainty. You would say psychological entropy, but I would say it's the reduction of uncertainty or ambiguity. Um, But, you know, so to me, that makes ontologies and concepts and categories like super interesting to study um, how mm. people do it because the same foibles keep coming up again and again and again. And actually, it's so funny that you bring this up because th- I think this is what I'm going to write about when I retire finally. You know, like when I'm done, I'm going <laughs> to write maybe some philosophy uh, of psychology or history of psychology. You should. Um, where I'm going to address this issue directly um, because I think this is, well, I wouldn't say it's the issue, but I think it's a fascinating issue um, that, um, and it's better to think of it as fascinating than depressing. It's like, geez, we've been having the same arguments for like 400 years, you know, or like 2000 years. I mean, um, so I'd, I'd rather be fascinated than demoralized. (laughs) Yeah. I'm still in the fascinated stage. Um, well, I found this a fascinating discussion today. Dr. Barrett, thank you for your revolution, your truly revolutionary uh, research in our field and for talking to me today on the Psychology Podcast. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for, for the wonderful discussion. I enjoyed it.
Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.